Hallelujah. Let me take off this muzzle. <laughs> Amen. I felt like a pit bull terrier. Hallelujah. Take the muzzle off. Amen. I appreciate being here in your wonderful new building. Hallelujah. Amen. Appreciate the invite. Amen. Into this sanctuary to worship with you. Amen. It's a wonderful time in the worship. Amen. I enjoyed every part of it. Amen. When I get to heaven, God will bless me with a voice like your pastor. Amen. For now, you got to cope with the croaky cockerel. Cockerel, cockerel. <laughs> Amen. Yeah, appreciate pastor. Appreciate what God's doing in his life. Amen. <clears throat> Hallelujah. Praise God. Next time, we're going to look at two portions of scriptures. This is what the Lord laid on my heart. Amen. As a preacher. You know, you contend for the mind of God and you, you seek, amen. But this is what's been laid on my heart to minister. And I pray that the Lord would speak to you this morning and minister to you this morning. <clears throat> Hallelujah. We're going to look at 1 Peter 5, 7, and then we're going to look at 1 Kings 19, 9 to 10. <clears> How <throat> I many know... Who's ever heard of the Dead Sea? <clears throat> I've never been there yet to see it, maybe one day. You see, when you look at the Dead Sea, it looks like there is life. But the reality is dead. That's why they call it the Dead Sea. Because the reason why it's dead is because it has no outlet. For a sea to have life, it has to have an outlet. In the same way as humans, how many know we need outlets in our lives? Otherwise, you are going to die within. And in these two texts, God shows us how he gives a prophet an environment where he can outlet. So we're going to look at, amen, 1 Peter 5, 7 and 1 Kings 19. 9 to 10. The Bible said, cast all your anxiety upon him because he cares for you. Let's jump to 1 Kings 19. Elijah has had a powerful experience in chapter 18. Fires come down from heaven. He receives a message that spins his mind out. And he runs, he runs, he hides under the tree. God sends him to Mount Horeb. And this is where we pick up from our story. Jesus said, look no more. In layman's terms, look happy, use Vaseline, use cocoa butter, or whatever you need to use in order to look normal in front of people. Jesus said, don't carry a sad face because he was dealing with a society that everything was the outward. He said, don't draw attention to yourself. So, then there's the glorification of the outward man in the negative. So we see the positives. How many know the world that we are living glorifies the external? It glorifies, it's all about the car you drive. It's all about the house you have, the clothes you wear. How many know that doesn't define who you are? In South Korea, they say, is known for big business for plastic surgery. Everything in South Korea is external. They said there are people that are not happy with their face, so they go to plastic surgeons, but the problem is they find many people go to unqualified plastic surgeons, and they do surgery in people's faces and mash up the face. Some I saw a video, a woman's face, like, 
She was so desperate to look perfect. She didn't discern what type of qualifications the surgeon had. He cut up and butchered her face, put plastic on, like a man who's just, you know, got no direction when he's doing drawing, just mash up the face and she came out. See, people are willing to pay whatever price they get for a new face. Certainly many end up, like I said, in clinics with unqualified, ex inexperienced doctors. I mean, not the church can focus on the outward. The church can focus on the building. The Bible talks about Jesus and the disciples. In Matthew 24, verse 1, Jesus left the temple and was walking away when his disciples came to him to call his attention to the buildings. Look at this building. They say when, uh, when Herod built the building, one part of the section took about 40 plus years and another part of the section of the temple took 39 years after Herod's death. And they said it was a glorious temple. So they were looking at the temple, looking at the bricks, and Jesus was saying, guys, you don't understand. One day, this temple is not going to exist. Some churches focus on the clothes you're wearing. Worshippers' clothes become the center of attention more than Jesus Christ. Come on, somebody. Others is how they keep a moral code, but yet are corrupt on the inside. And Jesus rebuked the Pharisees in Matthew 23, 20, said, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like whitewashed tombs, which outly appear beautiful, but within are full of dead people's bones and all the uncleanness. So Jesus, these people, they look trim. They look proper. Nails in the right place. Shoes polished. But he said, you focus too much on the outside more than you focus on the inside. You may look beautiful on the outside, but you're dead on the inside. I mean, you know, the prosperity gospel only focuses on the material. Nothing inward or eternal. Hyper grace, God will do everything for you. And that excuses the responsibility of people making decisions and choices. Secondly, I want to talk quickly. I'm going somewhere. The problem of saving face. There was a time where in a particular nation, there were airplanes crashing and the aviation department began to do some investigation on a particular nation or particular nations. And so what happened was uh, um, while the plane was in the air, the older captain would be in, his, in the plane doing whatever they're doing the younger captain will be looking and seeing if there's enough petrol to, to finish the journey. And so what happened was, what they found out was, when the younger one found out that the petrol was going down, let me give you some insight. I was in Australia, some pilot gave me some insight of how planes function. He says, you know, they, they take turns in, in driving the plane. But he said, you know what? The whole plane is full of petrol from the tail to the wing to all the way to the front. So he said that when you're sitting in the plane, underneath, you're literally sitting under fuel. And he said, what it is, they manage the fuel. So if fuel's running out in the back, they press a button, and then they start using the fuel on the wings. If the wings run out, then they press another button, they start using the fuel from the front. So the fuel is managed on the plane. And so he gave me some insight. So what happened is, you got these guys, they were on the plane as the plane was. So the young guy will be looking at the captain. The plane is going down. They're running out of petrol. But the younger one in that culture, they have a culture that if you try to instruct or tell the older guy, it will seem that you're being disrespectful. So what will happen is, as the plane is going down, the young man will keep his mouth shut. And him and the captain and the whole plane will die. 
And so the aviation done some investigation and began to teach these nations, forget about saving face. Forget about having this appearance. If the young ones trying to instruct you, let them instruct you for the safekeeping of everybody else. That's why there's a problem with saving face. See the problem, see in, in 1 Peter 5, 7, God is challenging us to make him an outlet. See, the problem is many see it as a weakness to share their problems with someone. Prince Harry, not that I get much quotes from Prince Harry. I know it's a controversy going on, but I'm not talking about his controversy. He begins, he said some years ago, he said, it's okay to suffer, but as long as you talk about it. It's not weakness. Weakness is having problem and not recognizing it, not solving that problem. Harry made that statement in 2013 after he said many years he was unable to talk about his mother's death. So he suppressed it for many years. And I look at Harry's life, he seemed like the black sheep of the family, partying, raving. Who knows? Maybe the suppression of that problem was the only way he could deal with the problem by trying to drink and, and party because the pain was so deep. And this could be the reason why. In 1 Kings 19, the Bible says Elijah felt fear in the cave. In chapter 18, he looked like he was in control. You know, he's mocking the, uh, um, the, 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 uh, he's mocking. Got too far ahead of myself. He's mocking the prophets of Baal. Okay, you call on to your God. Oh, Baal, Baal, hear us, Baal. Walking, you know, some people that walk on glass trying to think that God will come down. And they're whipping them to the coin, and Elijah's mocking them. <laughs> Maybe your God is sleeping. Maybe he's on a far journey, mocking them. How I many know he seemed in control? He prays and fire comes down and consumes uh, the offering. I mean, he's even cheeky to put water around the offering. Trying to say, listen, I want to prove that my God answers by fire. Fire comes down, consumes the sacrifice. But in chapter 18, we see him fearing for his life. And running away from Jezebel. When I was in China, a guy told me before he got saved how his first marriage got broken down. And he said he only talked about the problems of his ex-wife, but he never focused on his own self because he was trying to save face. Trying to show people I'm in control. I've got everything under wraps. I heard a, a, a story because of shame, a, a brother in India kills his sister because their family told her, you need to wear a scarf. And she decided, I'm not wearing a scarf. And he kills her, and they call it honor killing. And he did it because he was trying to save face. You know, let's put this on a personal level. We save face in many areas of our lives. Have you ever been to a, a restaurant or a takeaway? You know you're hungry. Come on, amen. And they ask you, do you want some food? But because you want to save face and pretend that you're not hungry and your belly is in control, you say no. Come on, somebody. In fact, they say in Romania, the culture is to say no, but you actually mean yes. So, you know, they say, but the problem is, if you've got that mindset and you come to England, how I many know some people, you know, you offer it, you want it? They'll go, no, no. Are you sure? Are you sure? No, 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 no. Are you sure? But how I many know England? Okay, no problem then. Different cultures. <laughs> Amen. <clears throat> this is why it's 1 Peter 5, 7. This is the reason 
why we need an outlet in our lives. Whether in married children, personal issue, God tells us we need an outlet. Because if you don't have an outlet, it's easy to become depressed. You will suffer lack of peace and can't sleep at night and it can cause a disease and things to be triggered in your life. And sadly, it's caused some people to commit suicide because they have no outlet. In verse 19, the Bible says the prophet wanted to die. This is why it's important we have an outlet in our lives. And this is what the text is saying. You know, the reality is we need, there's a need for us to have a cave experience. The Bible says Elijah was alone with God. God gave him direction. Go, I'm going to feed you. I'm going to uh, rest you. But you, I'm sending you to Mount Horeb. He sends him to Mount Horeb. Because God sent him to a mountain. Because God wanted to meet Elijah in a higher place. He wanted to show Elijah from a different perspective than what he was actually holding to himself. He wanted Elijah to see his circumstance based on God's point of view. You see, there are practically ways of dealing with stress and fear. Sometimes you just need an early night. Eat some good chicken. Rice. Sometimes I don't like eating heavy at night. I like e eating light. Come on, somebody. Who, who likes when you eat so heavy and you wake up in the morning, you feel, gro you feel I don't know the word, tell me. Croaky or groggy. Come on, amen. Elijah was in Horeb. And there's times when, so God, so here he is, God rested him and fed him. And what God did, he took him from the familiar to an unfamiliar place. Sometimes we got to find, a, a, remove ourselves from a familiar place. We need to find a place where we can outlet on God, whether that's in the heart, whether that's in the car, and we've got to learn to tell God the truth. Not how, what we think, but tell him the truth. Tell him your frustrations. You know, you can tell God your frustrations. Some people say, I have to go with the neat stuff before God. You can tell God your frustrations. In fact, when you tell God your frustration, real prayer kicks in. Because you're talking now, you're not, you know, sometimes we have to get rid of the, oh, oh, there's a place for that. You know what I'm saying? Tell God your hurts. Tell God your disappointments. In Psalm 62 verse 8, it says, trust in him at all times, you people. Pour out your hearts to him, for God is our refuge. If you're stressed at work, leave your work and get a coffee. Those little practical, amen. Sometimes you need to go for a brisk walk. Come on, amen. Not that I do much exercise, but one time, who's ever had foggy brain? Where you can't think straight. I went out. And I went for one of them walkings and joggings. Amen. As you can see, it's worked. I'm half the man I used to be. <laughs> Amen. I need more of them things. Amen. You see, God's practical solution for Elijah was, you are under stress. There's a lot of fear. You need to sleep. Elijah is sleeping. The Bible says an angel taps him 
and there's a pot of food he eats. Sometimes it's just sleep. Have a good early sleep and have a good early eat. Did someone say eat? <laughs> the Bible says God led Elijah to the cave to allow Elijah. I, you know, I've read Elijah so many times, but this jumped out at me. God led him to that cave to create a forum where he can outlet. This is why in 1 Peter 5, 7, he encourages us that we need an outlet where we can cast our burdens. Can I ask this morning, what burdens do you have? What are you carrying? Don't keep it to yourself. Cast it on God and also find a trusted friend. Talk to your pastor. Otherwise, you're going to explode within. Who's ever had a Coke bottle? <laughs> Thank God this is not lemonade. If I open it. Sometimes we feel like a Coke. It's not working. But sometimes, come on, Amen. who's ever felt like a Coke? And we're keeping it in, keeping it in, keeping it in. And someone just busts one joke and you explode. Come on here. You, we take it personal. When we're in, I mean, in them times, we're stiff, we're edgy, we're irritable. God says, there's a need to out. And I do say with people, if you're there, outlet little by little. Otherwise, <laughs> it remind me of a friend of mine. He said he was on the plane. And while he was on the plane, anyone traveled and some miracles or some stuff start happening in your stomach. You want to puke. So how many know when you're on a, on a vehicle, it's causing more problems? So I remember he said that he got up to run to the toilet. As he's running to the toilet, somebody's there in front of him. The person turns around, but it's coming. And it sloshed on the plane. But he said, I must say, the guy was very gracious towards me. I know a pastor would have gone, ah, God, what's the matter with you? I mean, a puke stinks. And sometimes uh, we've got things bottled in here. <laughs> Instead of releasing it slow, we release it all and we spew on people. Ah! Stink of our mess. So the Bible says that David needed an outlet. There was mighty men of God in the Bible that always, didn't always feel mighty. He was in a time of deep, deep discouragement. And the Bible said David had the trusted friend called Jonathan who could discern that David was not acting himself even when he puts on a show. And the Bible says that it was Jonathan who went to the woods and encouraged David in the woods because David could outlet on him. You'll be amazed how many people have left church because they didn't have an outlet. You'll be amazed how some people come into church and they say, you know what, this is my last service. I'm not coming back because they've suppressed and the feel I got no one to talk to. A friend of mine was telling me some guy came to church and said that very words. He says, he says uh, uh, so my friend said to the guy, you know what? If you don't want to chat to me, chat to that person over there. He went and chat to that person. After they finished chatting, the guy said, this was going to be my last time in church. But after, after he outletted on that person, he felt he could fight another day. Husbands, wives be an outlet to each other. 
even if you don't have the answer for them, because sometimes you don't. <laughs> Come on, but I've learned having a listening ear, but the problem is, as men, we are problem solvers. She's out letting, okay, what you need to do is X, Y, Z, Z, Y, E. Amen. Sometimes they don't want answers. They just want us to listen. Come on, amen. I do fall into that trap. So that I, I start to give answers. What you need to, like a doctor now, what you need to do. You know, there's many times my wife's come to me and, you know, when I've listened, she's got, oh, that feels better. And she moves on. And I think, what, you don't want advice? Come on. <laughs> Women are different. Come on, amen. Sorry to embarrass you, amen. Amen. Women are different. You know, a woman can talk to you. She's gone to Japan. She's gone to Mars. But there's no part line. She just wants to talk. As men, we want to give punch line. Come on, somebody. <laughs> you know, so I've learned, amen. And that helps me to listen to people when I try, amen. You know, sometimes I come back from a trip, you know. Anyway, that's another sermon. Amen. <laughs> <clears throat> Let's get back. You know, many times when you allow a person to speak, it helps them to process their own thinking. And sometimes they get the answers that they need by just talking. There. <clears throat> You see, telling frequently relieves tension. It relieves fears and anxieties. It lessens and sometimes it disappears entirely. And you find that the person who's been sympathetic and listening has helped the person who's unloaded to be free. You see, tonight, I mean this morning, can we not just learn to outlet on God, but can we also? Not only is God available to be outletted on, but we need to learn that others can outlet on us. That they can listen, we can listen to them without them feeling judged or condemned. They said in the newspaper, there was an article, it said Japanese men were paying, or men are paying for people just to listen to their problems. They're giving people money. Whether your heart's with me or your heart's not, I'm paying you to listen to me. So it tells you the great need today. Someone who will listen to their pain, failure, shame, and problems. I'm a me and my friend, we were passing a house, and a woman began, she, we overheard a woman say to someone, I have nobody to share my burdens with. And we said to her, you know what, try Jesus. Come on, somebody. In our text, 1 Peter 5, 7, God does not just say, cast our burdens on me. But Peter also adds the reason why God asks us to cast our burdens. Number one, God is a great listener. And he's not just a great listener, but behind his listening, he loves you. He's concerned about you and thinks about you. And he cannot help until we are an outlet on him. Can we learn to outlet on God and learn to be a people that people can outlet on? You may not have the problem, the answers, but at least you can listen and let them untie that valve, that pressure valve that's inside of them and find freedom. But I also want to ask, do you have an outlet? And have you learned to be a person someone can outlet on? Amen. Every head bowed, every eye closed this morning. You're here this morning. 
and you don't know Jesus Christ as your personal savior, we live in a chaotic world. We live in a world full of sin. And this world, all they do is just make decisions after decisions in sin, which causes more chaos. But in the midst of the chaos of this world, we've made chaotic decisions of sin ourselves. See, with sin comes consequence. And one of the consequences is separates us from God. God loves us, but he cannot tolerate sin. I mean, sin was such an issue that he sent the best that heaven can ever give. God could have sent an angels. He could have sent all the other things that he created in order to redeem us or to buy us back. But that wouldn't have been his best. He sent his best for us. And his best was his only son, Jesus Christ, who came down to earth. He didn't come through no shortcuts. Birth from a mother, virgin birth. Had to grow up like you and I. His bones and his muscles had to develop and become and grow within him and grow into a adulthood just like you and I. But the difference was Jesus was sinless. He was the only man that never sinned, not, that never yielded to temptation to sin, which qualified him to die for us. Jesus paid a bloody, he died a bloody death. On the cross because God hates sin but loves you and I at the same time Jesus bled so that you and I can find forgiveness and maybe you're here I remember at 17 I came into church I was tormented in my sin sin had began to work its consequence in my life to the point I wanted to commit suicide I was rock bottom but I heard the gospel, responded and found forgiveness and found a changed life, found the power to live a changed life. And maybe you're here this morning and say, preacher, I'm tired of the way I'm living. I'm tired of my sinfulness. When I try to stop sinning, I just can't do it because sin has a hold on you. The Bible says he that sins becomes a slave to sin. And maybe you're here this morning and say, preacher, I want to get right. I want forgiveness. I want to change life. I don't want to live the way I'm living. I want my life to be turned around. There's opportunity for you this morning. You're here and you need Christ. Christ is calling you. Lift up your hands. Anybody here? God's speaking to you this morning. Say, I need Jesus. Lift up your hands. Anybody here? God's speaking to you. Maybe you're a backslider. You turned away from God. You used to be a Christian. But now you're away from God. You want to get right. Lift up your hands. Anyone here? From my left to my right, front, back. Someone invited you and you're not right with God. God loves you and wants a relationship with you, but he has to deal with your sin. Lift up your hands. Anyone here? Backslide or not. Amen. Maybe you're live streaming. You want to give your life to Jesus. And you're here. I will lead you in a prayer if you're live streaming. Jesus to come in your life. And when you prayed, I believe there's a number that you text, saved, and someone will get in contact with you. Let's pray. Say, Lord Jesus, I come to you a sinner. I turn from my sin. I confess that you are Lord. And I believe in my heart that God has raised you from the dead. I ask Jesus to come into my heart and to save me. Lord, I thank you for your forgiveness and your mercy. Amen. If you believe that, if you live streamed, the Bible says your sins have been forgiven. You've become a child of God. Text saved with your name and somebody will get in contact with you. Okay, I want to turn this to the church. God says we need to outlet on him. 
Stop having saving face and pretending everything's okay. God said, outlet on him and learn that other people can outlet on you. You may not have the answers, but you can pray for them and believe for them. Or you can just listen to them and they can just take that pressure out of them and be set free. If God's spoken to you this morning, maybe you're here, you're a person, you like to suppress. I remember I was going through a situation. I spoke to my pastor. I said, you know what, pastor? I just suppress. He said, yeah, you know that's not good for you. You can't keep suppressing. What he's saying is you need to learn to talk about it. You learn to speak about it. And I took that on board. Hallelujah.